Just want to give you a little background on the area we're going to model. And this probably, this map doesn't mean too much to you. It's in Midwest America in Missouri. The town of Trenton down here, the town of Tyndall up here. Um, <clears throat> if you want to check it out on Google, you can probably get in the vicinity here uh, by looking up the town of Tyndall. But this is Missouri and it's farmland area. And the motivation for the resistivity survey that was undertaken here was to locate some of the deeper uh, glacial outwash channels that uh, exist in the area. A resistivity survey was run from south to north across this area using a Schlumberger array. We're going to focus on this sounding, this sounding one. There are a couple control wells here, so we know with a fair, fairly high degree of certainty what's going on at this sounding. So we'll uh, We'll start there. We'll form an interpretation in the next video, but for now, just a little bit of background. Uh, the sounding that we're going to be looking at will be a sounding that was conducted at this point. There are two wells here, uh, borehole wells with uh, information about the subsurface. You can see that there's a shallow gravel aquifer here, uh, but there's no deeper gravel aquifers. And of course, the deeper aquifers are the primary target of interest because they're larger and potentially can be used for irrigation of this farmland area, provide a larger supply of water. These shallow aquifers are fresher water. They have higher resistivity. They're also of interest. Uh, they can be used for local um, farm use, residential use. And this is just kind of a look at a glacial outwash plain and some of the channels that are formed in this kind of an environment um, out in advance of the <coughs> glaciers in the background here. So this is the original depositional environment, you know, of course would have date, dated back to the last period of uh, glaciation. So. The outwash channels sit on top of a limestone bedrock. It's a hard um, fractured bedrock, which is brackish. And um, so the bedrock aquifers, uh, which makes the resistivity problem a little bit non-unique, and we've talked about non-uniqueness before, and it also points to the differences between resistivity boundaries and lithological boundaries. Um, here we have a nice obvious lithological contrast where we've got uh, silts and sand, or kind of a sandy clay up here I guess as it's described, uh, sitting right on top of the limestone. So very distinct when you're looking at uh, drill hole data, you know, there'd be no question as, as to what your, you know, the difference, the contact, the location of the contact. But in terms of resistivity, the bedrock is fractured. Uh, the groundwater in the bedrock is brackish, so it tends to have a lower resistivity. And occasionally that uh, brackish water mixes with the um, overlying gravel aquifers in this area. So it makes this boundary sometimes transparent and difficult to, difficult to see. Frillick also provides us with let's call it an interpretation template. This could be a Rosetta Stone of sorts, but there, I think there are some, you know, when you model the data, you find that the um, uh, limestone bedrock may have higher resistivities, and even in his models, he shows bedrock resistivities up around 70, 75. But he breaks it down for us. Uh, we have these different uh, sediment types, uh, lith lithology types. We've got uh, gray, clays, yellow clays, we've got sand, actually a mixture mixture of sand and clay. Uh, we've got the drift fill aquifers at the, the deeper, larger drift fill aquifers with resistivities on the order of 40 to 50 ohmmeters, and we'll see the, the limestone here um, sometimes is not distinct. We don't 
we can't really be sure that it's there because of the influence of the brackish water reducing the resistivity. However, in some places it does have fairly high resistivity uh, up into the 70s, and then we have these near surface aquifers which are higher resistivity, and we'll see these in the model that we'll be looking at. And actually, they tend to be up here around the 100 ohm meter range. So drift fill aquifers uh, in this in this range, 40 to 50 uh, ohm meters, the limestone out here uh, and probably higher, and the shallow freshwater aquifers potentially spanning a wide range of resistivities, but we typically see the shallower freshwater gravels as having a higher resistivity around 100 ohm meters. The data, the sounding data, are plotted on the AB over 2 or the L over 2 scale, so this is a log scale. The interpretations are plotted on a linear scale, so there's kind of a mixture of scales here. And then down here we have a cross section which represents the interpretation, and you can see we can, uh, Froelich has interpreted bedrock down here and bedrock over here and here. Uh, we have a shallow, high resistivity uh, aquifer over here, 103 ohm meters. Uh, why exactly he extends it? Uh, now this is 110, um, 60, 60, 80, 50, and then we get down into this uh, clay interval. And uh, of course, you know, you, you go back to the interpretation template and you put in an interpretation which you think makes sense in the region. So it's, it, it is interpretive. So we do have an aquifer, a shallow gravel aquifer in here, uh, which is in the, in the near surface, probably the upper 10 meters, 10 to 15 meters. Over here we have an 80 ohm meter. I would say let's put a freshwater gravel in there and perhaps it's um, not, perhaps it doesn't extend all the way up to the uh, surface, although we do have, he does have a 75 ohm meter interval here, uh, 80 ohm meters, so we feel pretty confident putting in a shallow gravel aquifer there. 60, what do you think? Well, that's, is that one of the deeper, lower resistivity uh, aquifers? It, you know, it is interpretive, so, but it is not so deep. So perhaps it correlates with this, perhaps it does have a lower resistivity, maybe because of porosity. Uh, maybe it's a lower porosity uh, sand, uh, and therefore the water volume is not as high, so. Or maybe there are some dissolved, a greater uh, amount of dissolved solids in there. And then over here, this is a very distinct, a very high resistivity zone, which we would interpret as uh, one of the shallow aquifers, although it does extend over a considerable range of, of depths. So we're also looking for bedrock because the basal uh, drift fill aquifers are down against the bedrock. He's interpreted bedrock here. We actually have drill hole data over here, so we know that this should be there. We know that the bedrock should be about here. And this is about 35, 30, 35 meters, uh, you know, using the scale down here. And he's also interpreted bedrock over here on this uh, third and fourth sounding. But there are really no indications at all of bedrock over here. So. Does it just dive off, or do we have a lot of fracturing and we just have lower resistivity due to invasion of um, higher resistivity uh, brackish uh, formation water into the uh, deeper, deeper intervals? So it is an interpretive exercise. And <coughs> excuse me. And I assume that's why a lot of you are interested in uh, geophysics and geology, is trying to constrain these problems and work them out. So again, we're going to be looking at this sounding, and we've already kind of thrown together a, a general interpretation when we look at the data. This L over 2, sometimes capital L, is used as the total length or the AB distance between the current electrodes. 
L over 2 would also be AB over 2. So um, I think I dropped something in there. And so the next time we're going to form a qualitative interpretation of this first sounding and show you how, how to put things together. I mean, obviously you can see there's a low resistivity layer, high, low, high, and possibly another low, possibly another high resistivity layer in there. So without the computer, we, we aren't completely at a loss for making sense out of the data that we see. So we'll dig into that the next time. See you then. Thanks for joining us.